Good, good afternoon. Um, uh, on behalf of the McLean Center and Chess, Dr. David Meltzer and I uh, welcome you to our lecture series this year on improving value in the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Trent Haywood. Dr. Haywood is Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. As you know, a national federation of 36 independent, community-based, and locally operated Blue Cross Blue Shield companies. The Blue Cross Blue Shield system is the nation's largest health insurer covering one in three of all Americans. Um, as the association's chief medical officer, Dr. Hayward supports the innovation of Blue Cross Blue Shield in communities around the country in an effort to improve quality and patient safety. Dr. Hayward is also responsible for the Office of Clinical Affairs, which includes the Center for Clinical Effectiveness and the Center for Clinical Practices. Uh, collectively, this Office of Clinical Affairs supports opportunities between Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies and stakeholders to improve the choices for affordable, high-quality health care to all members. Dr. Hayward also serves uh, as president of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Institute, the first of its kind uh, as a benefit corporation established to address social determinants of health through technology and strategic collaborations. In addition, Dr. Hayward oversees the National Council of Physicians, uh, which consists of chief medical officers and chief pharmacy executives that guide the clinical direction for Blue Cross Blue Shield companies. Today, Dr. Hayward's talk, as you can tell by looking behind me, is entitled Selfies and Social Determinants of Health, Improving Healthcare Value Propositions. Please join me in giving a warm welcome, Dr. Trent Hayward. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully you can hear me okay. Are you able to hear me okay? Okay, great. I'm going to walk around and then we'll get into the lecture. Uh, this seems to be a relatively informal setting, so I'll keep it relatively informal. At some point, because it's University of Chicago, if you decide you, we want to make it more formal, you give me some signal, I'll stand behind the podium and, we, and we'll do it that right. I appreciate having an opportunity to come over with you guys to spend time, your lunch time with you. I know you, this is a lecture series in which you guys are focusing on value. I've had a lot of experience in a lot of different places, and so I'll walk through some of those particular activities of where I was at the bedside, I was at CMS, I worked with um, uh, community health centers around the country, and now I'm at uh, Big Blue Cross and Blue Shield. By show of hands, just so I get a sense of who's in the room, uh, medical students? Are there any medical students? Is there a reason why the medical students don't really want to raise their hand? Do you guys beat up on them or something? Like, they, they barely raise their hand. Nurses? Great. So medical students, nurses, uh, I think I heard that there's ethic fellows. Are there ethic fellows? Ethic fellows? Um, physicians? Great. Um, any other allied health professionals that I'm missing? What? Psychologists? What else? Anything else I missed? Great. Pharma pharmacist as well? Pharmaceutical industry. Pharma what does that mean? <laughs> what are you doing here? Pharmaceutical industry. Tell me more. What do you mean by pharmaceutical industry? Like what? Like what part of pharmaceutical industry? So, um, marketing. Marketing? Marketing? Of the public health. Okay. By the way, I don't, I'm not one uh, insurance uh, payer that hates pharmaceutical companies, just for the record. And we can get into that in, if, in a minute if we want to as well. Any other ones that we didn't uh, cover? Okay. Research staff. Research staff is here too? Perfect. Research staff? Okay. Uh, I see you got some attitude with it too. Okay. Um, what else? Anyone else that we didn't cover? Okay, so there's a, a very diverse perspectives in the room given where you uh, have the particular job titles or what you're seeking. And so when we get into something like value, obviously value has something that's unique and specific to the individual or the perspective that you bring to bear. And so because we are comfortable in a 90-minute session 
I'm going to allow you to please feel free to stop me, interject, engage any way you want. You can tell by the title that I picked that I don't take myself too serious, except when it gets time to like making a difference for patients or the members we serve. And then we get into some specific serious issues around that. Otherwise, life is short. We try to keep it fun and interactive. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, now that I've warmed you up with raising your hands, raise your hands if you love health insurance companies. <laughs> What the heck just happened? Like, I, I, had, I, spur, I purposely like had y'all do that test run so you got comfortable raising your hand so that I get everybody to raise their hand. I got like three people. OK, so let's talk a little bit about that before I get into my presentation. Anyone that didn't raise their hand that would be willing to share why they didn't raise their hand, tell me. Shout it out. Why didn't you raise your hand when I said, tell me if you love health insurance companies? Why? Why, why didn't you raise your hand? Go ahead, start. I'm in mental health care. I'm fighting constantly to get a neuropsychological assessment that is live, where you can just different Great. So you have barriers as it relates to, to the health insurance companies. And you said you're fighting that constantly? Great. Thank you for being honest and sharing. Others that didn't raise their hand, yes, please. And can you kind of, you have to project in this room because it's a big room, so you got to throw your voice out there. So similar to what Scott said, um, they give us a hard time when we order some tests that we think are important for um, the care of our patients. And mm -hmm. not just that, but even when you're trying to explain why you think you need that test, the process was here such a long time, and that physicians were very busy. Great. So that's helped me. What's, you said his name is Scott. What was your name? Jemana. Jemana? Thank you for sharing, Jemana. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Abraziz. Uh, and shout your voice out, because, again, it's a big room. Uh, the problem that I face in Cuyahoga, uh, in a private uh, institute, so uh, the, the failed rejections that uh -huh. we, always, uh, we always face, which is can't, can't be explained much. So like they have like, a fixed percentage of claims. The, a fixed percentage? Yes. Fixed percentage that what did you say? Rejection of claims. You believe, at least in your experience, is that the health insurance have at least a certain fixed percentage that they're going to reject all those claims? This is what happens with us. It's like almost a monthly fixed. Great. OK. So go ahead, David. Uh, uh, I'm David Meltzer. I, I don't like insurance companies because they do business with all the other people I don't like in health care, which uh -huh. starts with doctors, hospitals, <laughs> government, and I could probably think about more, but I'm you're going to spread the love of the people that you dislike. Like, my perspective is, like, this is an interlocking set of very powerful organizations that are all trying to figure out how to survive in a screwed up system that ultimately doesn't help the country to be nearly as much as it should. So I don't think you guys are any worse than anyone else, but I think collectively we're failing. That's OK. I'm, I'm willing to pick a pure group and being the best among a bad lot if that's the, if that's the, if that's the choice that's given. I have a simple one. Yes. Pre-authorization. Tell us about pre-authorization. What is it about the pre-authorization? Many insurance companies require that you get advanced authorization uh, to order diagnostic tests, uh -huh. to prescribe medications, um, and it takes an unbelievable amount of time uh, to work your way through that. Great. So we also heard, so another barrier, time, and this one, pre-authorization, claims adjudication. You guys talked about other. Yes, in the middle here, you have two more here. Go ahead. Yeah, Dan Broder. Um, I think that the whole notion of health insurance encourages um, the administration of procedures because it's easy to assess the price of a procedure and hard to assess the price of the cost. So there's not a lot of thinking that's going on in medicine because that's not what that's not what people reimburse for. And when they do try to do that, it just makes for a pile of paperwork. Great. And the system itself, the whole idea of paying doctors for what they do by the piece, fee for service, which the insurance company sort of helps to be, really gets in the way of taking care of it. So if we were paying in a different model, you'd be more supportive of a different model? Or do you, you have a fundamental problem with paying, paying clinicians at all? No, I think they should be paid, but I think when you start paying, um, when, you, when you try to figure out how to pay them in a way that incentivizes them, that it, it, it messes with the, the 
I mean, but should 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 physicians really be like priests or nuns and just go ahead and go that route instead of worry about reimbursement all the earth? Like teachers, Chicago's public school teachers. <laughs> all right, and then you had your hand up. Okay, and I'll tell you on that one, um, Amy Risk is here with me. Um, Amy, you can stand up uh, just to say hello. Um, so she's going to take all the tough questions like that one at the end. No, she's going to make certain that I remember that and come back to that one. Okay, we'll come back to that one because that gets really specific about how we do product or benefit design and what we put into the market in terms of what people actually purchase. Because in the private sector, and including, you can even say government programs such as Medicare Advantage, you're putting a product out there, and people are actually having to compete for that actual product, and then they actually purchase that product, what we call an insurance product. Within that insurance product, it has certain benefit designs, and they vary. And maybe at the end, we'll come back to that specific question. If for some reason we can't get it all in, then maybe we'll follow up with you directly to get your answer. Yes, sir? Uh, disparity in bureaucracy. It's hard to navigate for patients and for doctors. Great. Okay. So a lot of a lot of reasons not to fall in love with the insurance company. So I'm a kid originally from Southwest Oklahoma, and I grew up. Uh, and by the time I was in fourth grade, my teacher came to me and said to me, "You got to make a decision on what you want to do in life." I know it's ridiculous, right? But I was nine years old in Southwest Oklahoma, and if your teacher says you got to do something, you got to do something. So over the weekend, I had to come back and tell her what I want to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want homework over the weekend. That's about as far as my thinking was at that particular time. And so I was pretty, uh, talk about disparities, I was a straight A student, and I didn't understand why the straight A students getting homework for the weekend and the other kids get to play, <laughs> right? So I said to my parents, what do I need to tell her? Like, what are the great career choices? And they pretty much said, oh, be a doctor or a lawyer. Both of them are great professions. Pick one of those. My parents were um, a teacher's aide and a counselor. Pick one of those and you're fine. So I just walked in and told her I'd be a, teach, uh, a doctor. And so the fine time from I was in ninth grade all the way up through med school, I pretty much was on that path purely because my fourth grade teacher told me that's what she wanted. Right, literally. Now, fast forward, if you end up seeing my bio at all, I all did go back and get a law degree as well at what was normally considered a competitive University of Chicago Law School in the city, which is Northwestern Law School as well. So I ended up getting both of those as well. Now, when I got the medical school degree, and then we're going to get into some of this, the reason why I was asking you guys these basic ideas, my parents loved it. They were just blown away. Look at my boy, you know, we started from humble beginnings, became this doctor in the big city of Chicago, blah, blah, blah. Look at all these great attributes about being a doctor. And then when I came out, then I decided to go to law school, became a lawyer. They weren't certain what was going on, but they said, OK, you know what? He got another degree. It's not a bad problem. Don't worry about it. And then when I came out of law school, I went to work for CMS. Then I got worried. Because then they said, OK, we thought we had this son, and we all understood the story we were telling our neighbors and friends and family back home, how great it was to be a doctor. He's decided to go work and become a federal government employee. right? Then finally, fast forward, you know, I did that. I redeemed myself a little bit because I went to work for big health systems. Uh, and then finally, you see, I ended up at a big, bad insurance company, and they lost all hope. <laughs> so my parents aren't dissimilar to you in the crowd in terms of falling in love or in and out of an insurance company. Now, if you notice that when I asked you guys what is it about health insurance companies that you didn't like, a lot of it came to do with certain aspects, not all of them, so I'm being general for the sake of the discussion, a lot of it had to do with all the barriers that you were uh, dealing with. Impediments to getting done with the job that you believe that you need to do for the patients that you're trying to serve. And that's the reason we ended up coming up with this particular title, Selfies. And then now I'm going to get into this disclaimer here because anytime I do a presentation, I try not to be too boring myself. But if nothing else, I like to enjoy the presentation myself. And then hopefully you get something out of it. That's how I do it. And so I said, well, every time I go, especially this time of season, you know what, what even though the calendar has changed, what season are we in in Chicago? 
What'd you say? Okay, see, Amy grew up in Texas, and I grew up in southwest Oklahoma. And by the time you got to May, we considered it summer no matter what, to, what, no matter what you tell us, right? It was already summer to us, right? May is summer. I had to come up north, and then, then I realized you guys called May spring because days like today. But the reason why I'm asking you what season it is, if you walk across, if you're downtown like where we're local, located, what season it really is is selfie season. This is a season that the tourists are all coming to Chicago. People from the suburbs come into the city as well. You can't get past the bridges on Michigan Avenue or any of those because everybody's stopping to take a selfie. It's selfie season. So by the time you get to May to all the way to at least late September, just be clear, if you come downtown Chicago, it's selfie season. Don't get upset with people because they're going to have their selfie sticks out. They're going to stop in the middle of the street, and they're going to take a bunch of photos. The question is, that I wanted to play with this is, selfies now are simple and easy to do. It's relatively quick and efficient to get what you want out of a selfie. That didn't used to be the case when you actually used to do other photos, right? If you go back, are there any uh, photographers in the room? Anybody that, OK. Do you have any uh, ideas or thoughts about what it used to take to, to take a self-portrait? So in the 70s, you were using a mirror to try to make it happen. So now it's so simple and efficient, you know immediately whether you like it or not. And so the issue that I was raising and playing with when I decided to do this is like, hmm, if we really improve the value proposition within the healthcare, would it be as simple as actually taking a selfie where it would work that efficient? So that's the idea that we were playing with. As we continue to move forward, we'll play with other aspects about how we actually create value in healthcare and how we um, end up creating efficiencies as well. So let me play with that construct, and then we're going to get into how you might fall in love with the insurance company. I'm going to let you pause on that for a second, because you're trying to envision what this insurance company might look like that you could fall in love with, right? All right, we got it. All right. So this is a disclaimer, because anything I say cannot be attributed to Blue Cross Blue Shield or Blue Cross Blue Shield plans or anybody that you might know other than Trent Haywood. OK? That's the legal side of me getting the disclaimer out the way. So taking a selfie. There's a lot of reasons why people take selfies. I'm only going to use three of them, because they just allow for jumping off for discussion purposes. And keep in mind, we're going to have discussion here, right? So even though I'm supposed to be doing a lecture, as you can tell by my format, it's kind of give and take. And I'm quite comfortable with you guys pushing back and forth about how I do some of this, so please feel free to. One reason that they do it is just pure documentation. You see that all the time on the bridge that I talked about. If you're on Michigan Avenue and you're going across the river, you know a lot of times they're just taking that selfie for pure documentation. So they want to memorialize the situation. Whatever's occurring at that particular time, they just want to memorialize the situation they're not necessarily on the, at the beginning of that putting any value propositions or judgment on that just yet. And we'll come back to that because someone has already raised this issue of when I asked about insurance companies, one of the issues that they found problematic. Okay, So taking a selfie, just like social determines health, all you're doing is documentation or you're memorializing the situation. So what are examples of that? So this, this is a pointer, right? Has anyone seen this photo or know what this is? Or if you're not, you can guess too, right? You can, this is not the, this is, you're not, in this lecture share, you're not uh, graded good or bad if you guess, by the way, right? So what do you think this is? Let me, let me do it another way then. Let's, let's get closer to it, right? We'll do uh, deductive reasoning. What, what era is this? What, what, what time period is it? All right, so outer space, great. It looks kind of old. Looks kind of old, like how old, old? Like 60s. Yes. This is, so this is the 60s. Most of this crowd never heard of the 60s, is that correct? <laughs> no, so this is the 60s. This happened to be 1966, right? This is Buzz Aldrich, 1966, and the Gemini. And so this is literally a selfie. Well, he literally did a selfie to show that he was outside the Gemini capsule and wanted to be able to show that he was actually in outer space. Documentation, I was here, right? Just memorializing the situation. 
memorializing what actually occurred. Last year, I had the same situation, even though it wasn't a selfie. I have a few of these that's not selfie, but it, it works for the conversation about documentation. Who's this short guy right here with the bow tie? Wild guess. Me, right? So you got one short guy over here with a messed up tie, and then you got a taller guy over here with a messed up tie here, too. So we got two guys. Who's this guy over here? People on University of Chicago don't know who, don't who he is? Y'all don't know who he is? Only Texans know who he is? The South Side of Chicago doesn't know who this guy is? Who's that guy? George Dunbridge. George Dunbridge. Yeah. yeah, and this was uh, last year. Um, and so this is uh, last year in Florida, and we happened to host uh, the former president. Um, and so you can tell this is just a photo where we're together. And it's nice that he you know, gives me a nice hug, and it's really nice that we both have our ties screwed up, and that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> Pure documentation. Take a photo. You can tell family and friends that you met the former president, and he was nice whatever you want a DA to do. How do we do that in healthcare? Since you guys are talking about value. What is the value of documentation? So someone talked about E&M codes a little bit or start to at least get into that a little bit when they started talking about some of this. What is that? What is E&M codes? What's E&M codes? What is that about? Do you guys know? Does anybody in the room know? Okay. So billing codes, right? So your, these billing codes relate to documentation, but what does that have to do with value? What's the value in the documentation of the billing codes? Well, last year. What? Better reimbursement. OK. Why are you So let's take that. What's your name, ma'am? Marsha. Thanks, Marsha. We really appreciate you helping us out, because the other ones are too shy, Marsha. So we need somebody to work with me. So if I said to you guys, one way to improve the value of the healthcare system is to improve your documentation, you agree or disagree? Wait. We know, I can, I can guarantee you that I can find resources in this great institution that spends their time improving the documentation of clinicians. I'm pretty sure about that. And you're telling me they're not having an impact on improving the value proposition of healthcare? Right. Tell me more. Why? Tell me. What's no, no, here and then I come back. They're, they're splitting a, a lunch, so I think it's only fair for them to talk, and then I come back to you after they finish splitting the lunch. I'm just teasing you guys. Go ahead, the two of you. Yes. Uh, it seems that the, the documentation has become more and more uh, a billing document as opposed to actually documenting what's happening with the patient clinically. Okay. And it's become more voluminous and less informative <clears throat> to the, the clinicians that are actually providing the care and the purpose so it seems to have become a billing document. Okay. So that's frustrating as a clinician. So so if someone came up to you again just to clarify, let's assume let's stipulate that's true for now, then you would say that's not really about improving health care. It's just purely documentation for the purpose of documentation. It allows for reimbursement purposes, but it's not necessarily linked to improving the care, at least the way it's done. Reimbursement or lack of reimbursement, but it, it, it allows for the I, I like the or lack thereof reimbursement. I like that. Okay. And did you want to say something as well, ma'am? Okay. Sir in the middle here with the glass? He's got it. Any others? So this whole room. If you see someone that their job in this institution is about improving documentation to help clinicians improve documentation, you would say that's nice, it's a necessary job, but it's not necessarily related to improving the value of health care. Is that, is that the consensus? Yes, ma'am. That's the most important health insurance is documentation. What'd you say? It's the most important thing in health insurance to document everything, plans, and everything. So I don't think it's not necessary. You don't think it's even necessary? No, she said it's not. She doesn't think it's not necessary. Oh, OK. You think it's necessary, then, that you have it, but it might not be ready to improve in health care? Uh, is that correct, the value? OK. And also, just the other way to think about it, it's just, it's just very costly. So yesterday, uh -huh. I was in clinic, and I tried to order a mammogram for a patient. And I 
and I needed to associate a diagnosis with it. And for some reason, the codes that I've always used in the past for screening mammogram weren't working. So I had to go find someone who could tell me that, that you actually had to use this template to order it, and only then did it associate. I probably wasted a good 20 minutes. Wow. You know, just around trying to find that code. And as I understand it, you know, part of the dilemma in this is that it is, I guess, illegal to put um, hints in an epic as to what a diagnosis is that makes something billable because they think that doctors are going to change the diagnosis because of this. But like that's an example of the type of thing that I think frustrates people. Yeah, so let me tell you and build off that. And uh, for since I gave that big disclaimer, I'm not going to give legal advice, right? So, I, so that's the other disclaimer I can give. So I won't opine about the legalities of what you can do or not do in uh, EHR, whether it be Epic or Cerner or any of them. When I was at CMS, one of the biggest issues that we spend a lot of time on this, and we'll talk a little bit about, about this with RVUs as well, about how much documentation we were going to require, right, for your evaluation and management codes, and what would it require, and particularly back then, because it was much more about what level was required for a particular documentation. And to David's point, we would sit there, and, and I would tell them, I'm like, I'm not fully understanding why we're spending so much time on verifying the level uh, within here, because as soon as they do implementation on EHR, you can default to level five if you want to and actually just make certain that you answer all the questions and you'll get a level five if that's what you want to do. You can get the documentation done. Now, to your point, there's ways in which so then we have to distort it and say, well, don't allow the default to be on there and all this other stuff that we have to necessarily do. I used to go around and, um, and when I was helping hospitals, on the same thing, I would go around, the hospitals would complain to me, this again when I was at CMS and then subsequently when I left CMS, and the surgeons would say, you see this? And they have a stethoscope around, their, um, around them. This is particularly as I'm in the pre-op or something like this. I said, yeah, I see you got the stethoscope. It's like, yeah, it makes no sense that I have this stethoscope on me. The only reason I have this stethoscope on is because I got to do this documentation, and so I got to do all this stuff for documentation purposes. But if you guys had another way where I could still get the same reimbursement that the hospital and the surgical team needs for the same particular procedure, I wouldn't be spending my time doing the documentation because I think it has no impact whatsoever on how I'm going to actually care for that particular patient. So those are situations to us that if we're in agreement, this in and of itself, there are ways to improve this. And we, um, Martin talked about prior authorization. There's, uh, that's a big debate right now. I spend a lot of time with the AMA, the American Medical Association, on this particular issue. There's a lot of legislation within the Beltway right now about what we should do about prior authorization or not. Uh, it's a big fight at state government, uh, state houses right now about whether or not you can allow health insurance companies to continue to do prior authorization the way that we do prior authorization or not. Now, you got to understand, because we're talking about this series about value, and I think uh, someone raised the question earlier on about the product that Amy's going to come back and talk a little bit about at the end, or, I'll, or she, at least she'll remind me to. On the other side, and for now, I'm going to talk about commercial, and then we can talk about government. Just on this one particular issue, I'm talking about commercial. Keep in mind that that insurance is a contract. So it's, it's not, we're not talking a social contract. We're talking about a real contract right now within the four walls of that, four corners of that particular contract. So if you have a big employer, University of Chicago could be your employer, but if you have a big employer, they reached an agreement with that health insurance company about how to abide by that particular insurance contract, and you're only supposed to do what's medically necessary, nothing more, not, nothing less. And so there's ways in which to be able to determine whether or not something is medically necessary, I have a lot of responsibilities in that particular space as the chief medical officer, working with the chief medical officer across the entire Blue Cross and Blue Shield system, focusing on just that issue, medically necessary. And Amy will tell you, because late yesterday, I spent a lot of time on transoral incisionless frontal plication. Is it medically necessary or is it not? Does it really make a big difference or not? How much evidence is really there to support it or not? All that relates to this particular issue here. But let's assume e &M for now, just to keep moving forward, let's assume e &M codes alone is not going to necessarily improve uh, the value proposition for healthcare. What about this? Documentation of quality measures. Clearly, that's not the same as e &M codes, right? I used to lead the quality measurement at CMS for nationwide. When CMS decided to actually link all their first public reporting to quality measures, 
we spent a lot of time saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to document to the public the level of quality of the services that you're providing for your patient population. What about that? Is that improving the value? So, so we have Eric Schneider here. Uh huh. Just and then I come back here, yes. Eric Schneider was here and he worked at NCQA, right? Yes. And, uh, he basically went through 20 years of quality improvement and this measurement. And I would say the fair summary is not done much. Not done much, that's what Ed concluded? That's his conclusion. Okay. In the back? Yeah, it, it feels like similar to your first conversation, that it's actually not documentation of quality measures, it's the documentation of the documentation of quality measures, that you are not measuring quality, you are measuring how I document it, which is a very different piece. And so you were saying in the current, at least in the current way that we actually do the quality measurement, and I just use your example of documentation of the documentation, not necessarily documentation of the quality. You don't believe right now that the, all the work that we did on quality measures, and particularly, I'm going to come back to linking it to payment, but for now I'm just talking about the public reporting portion of it. Documentation that allows public reporting of quality measures, improving the value of healthcare or not? I think it drove the conversation about quality, but I don't feel like it did much for quality. It, it was almost the lowest common denominator bar that got raised. Is there anyone that's willing to argue the opposite? Go ahead. Let me ask it another way. To you, I'm gonna build up on your point. Do we want a world? Because we can go back to a world where there's no quality measures that's out there for comparison purposes. And we can go back to a world where we don't have public reporting, right? Because we had that world, and it wasn't too long ago, right? So, do we believe uh, that's a better that's a better way to do improving the value? Is to no longer do the public reporting on the quality measures? Does anyone believe that? that we should get rid of it and not do it? Yes. Uh, I think the, 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 the principle of uh, looking at revealing quality measures, I think, is a, is a good one. It's the, the nature of the measure. You know, the, right, the devil's in the detail. And what sometimes the measures, it seems, are things that are being easily quantified that aren't necessarily actually reflecting uh, true quality. And that's, I think, where the, uh, the problem is. I think the principle of, of measuring quality is a good one. And I think you can be aware of that. Just what do you measure? Okay, so let me take your, your comment and say, if I hear you correctly, and I think that was similar to another comment about not just documentation for the documentation of the measure, if we could implement it properly, and I'll put whatever properly is in, in quotes, documentation of the quality measure could improve the value of healthcare? You believe it could? All right, so you are making a distinction at least between the E&M codes and the quality measure. You think this has more of a chance of improving the value than the E&M codes or not, really? They're yeah, interrelated. Tell me more. You need to, you won't be doing quality for the sake of quality, and somebody has to pay for it. Everybody that's willing to pay for it, it's within the four borders of the contract. They need to get some money out of it. To get some money out of it, they need to measure. The way to measure is through the building code. Okay, so you're thinking this might be a means to this particular end. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I mean, just a couple things. One is that we know that there's a lot of variability in position and crackness. And so if you're doing things in diagnoses where they're not really indicated, that's a problem. So e and is critical. So that, right. I mean, I think the, rub, the big rub on quality measures is that um, Many, many of them are focused on very easy to measure things, like, for example, preventive care. But it's not only just that. It's easy to measure things that the powerful parties want to measure. So like, if you go back to HEDIS measures, a lot of it's around preventive care. Why? Because capitated organizations that get incentives to provide capitated care make their money, from my perspective, and caring for healthy people, not on the really sick complex. For them, it's pretty easy to make sure they get their mammogram, to get to make sure right. they, they get their pap smear. Now that is quality, right. but in the world of what healthcare does, is that enough to really create the value case around so many things that we've done? And, and, and that's what gets unclear to me, especially when 
There are other mechanisms that really can promote quality, such as you know, the reputation of a really extraordinary clinician caring for really complicated cases in the context of a, an environment where you know, there's knowledge of peers. Right. And, and that, that is, you know, to some extent, um, in competition with these sort of approaches. Because these sort of approaches favor institutions that are huge and powerful right. and invest a lot in technology. And the other sort of approaches favor institutions where you have intimately connected individuals who together have a reputation that they care about. So I just came earlier today from Ingalls Community yeah. Hospital, which is, I would say, almost a relic of that era of American medicine. And I'm not sure that the new system that favors this sort of stuff is a whole lot better always than some parts of the other one. So I guess my question is, like, how do you know? All right, so we're going to, I, I agree that, you know, so what um, Dave is reminding me of is so on that, uh, I'm not taking all that in, but uh, when I, one of the problems we had when we started to do quality measures early on with CMS and the public report and before we started linking it to payment, to David's point is we, would, we knew like internists and family practice uh, physicians, we could easily get a bunch of measures. As we got into some of the surgical specialties, less so. There's less literature in certain surgical, surgical specialties altogether. And because there's less literature, then there's less of a, a ability to be able to create quality measures that we'd find acceptable. And so I remember today's point calling surgeons saying, hey, we're going to do this with you or without you because we can't have these guys where only the internists or family docs are doing these measures, but the specialists get a pass. Right, because then that's just putting more pressure on PCPs and family physicians, and that means that they're less likely to want to be able to continue to do that because they're getting less reimbursement than the specialists anyway. And so we literally would ask them, like, okay, if your family member needs this particular, uh, especially uh, this surgery, would you know how to go about and find the appropriate surgeon for that particular family member? And if you can answer that, then we say, well, then that's what we're going to use to be able to actually build a measure is how you would actually make that determination. So there are ways, as David said, that we would actually go ahead and do that. All right, so I'm going to keep moving because we just started the discussion. So this is just one area, which is just about documentation. It sounds like a mixed bag in this room as to how much documentation really improves the value of healthcare. Uh, it might be necessary, but it's not, it's not as sufficient to necessarily improve the value proposition of healthcare. And at the end, we'll talk about what we collectively mean by the value proposition of healthcare. So, I call this examination, it might not be the right term, but the idea is that it goes beyond documentation. So when you're taking that self, it's a little more than just documenting whether you're there or not, right? That you're really starting to examine or put some type of analysis into what you're seeing uh, in that particular photo or how it's unfolding. So you can do it for examination purpose where you want to actually do some type of analysis. So you really want to understand the interaction that's occurring at that particular time. And by understanding the interaction that's occurring, then it allows for opportunities for improvement. If you understand the interaction that's occurring, or at least you understand some of the relationship that's unfolding. So how many of you remember this selfie at all? So you got these three people, and then you got somebody over here. <laughs> the person over here doesn't look the same as these three people. What's going on in this selfie? Who can tell me what's going on in this selfie? Again, you don't have to be right, so just throw it out there. What's, at minimum, what do you think is going on in this selfie? Somebody's left out of the picture. Yes, this person is definitely left out of the selfie, right? <laughs> These three look like they're having a, do they look like they're having a good time or a bad time? Okay. This person look like a good time or a bad time? Somebody on the other side is going to have a bad time later on. <laughs> and it's probably going to be this person, huh? I'm assuming everybody at University of Chicago is required to at least know who this person is since she worked here, right? So who is that? You guys are so quiet. Yes, Michelle Obama, yes. So this is the former first lady. Obviously, that means he's the, the president. Um, I'm blanking. She's the prime minister, Danish prime minister, if I'm not mistaken. And then, who, do you remember who that is? The British prime minister, right? David Cameron. So, why is she looking like this and they're so happy? What's going on? 
Remember I said examination of itself is sometimes about understanding the interaction. What do we think the interaction here? Because those three are enjoying themselves. She's not. What's going on? She's definitely not president, but that never bothered her before. She never really wanted to be in the politics. What's going on? She was paying attention to the funeral. Remember? Whose funeral is this? Nelson Mandela. So this is Nelson Mandela's funeral. Oh, wow. Somber moment. Nelson Mandela funeral. And the whole world is watching this go on and still Nelson Mandela's funeral. Michelle's not happy. And as you said, if you notice, the, as soon as this was over, the next photo, all of a sudden, Barack Obama is back to as stern as he can be and as solemn as he can be because he got the side eye from Michelle. <laughs> right? So that's what this self is about. It's an examination, understanding. But otherwise, these people know each other, they interact, they're having a good time. But there's a problem here in this particular selfie because Michelle reminded them that they're not paying proper respect to the former leader of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, at the funeral. Just a simple one for examination purposes. Now, here, this is that short guy again with another bow tie on. It's a little dark in this photo, but got, do you guys know who this is at all? Can you tell? OK. This is Magic Johnson. So we just talked to Martin. Amy and I just talked to Martin. This was last week down in Texas. Magic Johnson happened to come and present to us. And yes, he's literally about two foot taller than me. You know, he's like, he's 6'9", I'm 5'6", so it's almost two feet difference uh, taller than me. But instead of like one with George Bush, what we're sitting up here doing, I'm trying to talk to him about something I'll talk to you guys about at the end, where we're trying to make a difference for certain uh, communities and Magic Johnson Enterprise might be able to do that for us. And so we want to have this discussion and dialogue about that. So what you're really seeing is I'm, not, I'm less interested about taking a photo with him. I'm more interested about getting some business done. So if you saw the previous one, President, former President George W. Bush just taking a photo. Magic, I need to holler at you, player. Can I holler at you? So that's what's happening here, right? Well, I'm truly just trying to holler at him and saying, I got to get something done. I think you guys can help us get this done. And so it just so happened somebody took a photo of me trying to get something done with Magic Johnson here, right? And then you got everything else. So here you can see all that played out a little bit different than what you saw with the previous one, just by the way that the photo looks. So now. What is the value of the examination? So let's get into this because we started off here a little bit where we said, okay, we're going to go beyond documentation. RVUs, what is RVUs? It has the word value in it. So you can't tell me that we're not trying to improve value if the word has value in it, right? I mean, you, you guys are going to burst my bubble and tell me that. What is RVUs? Who knows what RVUs are? Measures of productivity. Okay, not just physicians, but yeah. And um, so, and what's the R? Do you happen to know what the R stands for? Okay, so the measure, you said measure of productivity. People argue about whether it's really productivity or not, but it doesn't matter for the purpose of this lecture series. To me, it doesn't, at least for today. So relative value units. When you hear a term like that, relative value units, what does that sound like, relative value units? What does that sound like we're doing? Comparisons. Flat out comparisons. Relative value of one thing, relative to another thing. And we just happen to have, we use units for it. And any of you that's ever actually uh, spent time doing any of this, it goes through a process normally at the AMA through the uh, Resource Utilization Committee or the RUC. You'll hear people use the term RUC, R-U-C. Spend a lot of time with that particular attribute because all the clinicians are arguing about their particular work should have more RVUs than the previous one. And you heard someone earlier on talk about the difference between procedurals and whether or not we get higher RVUs for that versus if you're actually doing mental, like psychology and some other things where you might not necessarily be able to do it as effectively. A lot of that has to do with whether or not you can quickly and efficiently identify the inputs for that RVU, right? Which means the cost inputs relative to others where you might not necessarily be able to put the cost inputs into it. So let's just take this first, the RVUs. If you work on RVUs, are you improving the value of healthcare? What's wrong with you working on RVUs to improve the value of health care? There is no way to determine the value of what you do for patients. It is interaction. It is, it is just like there is no RVU for your love for you and your children and your friends. 
Somebody could be artificial, like a cake, a lot of color on it, and it statistically looks so good, and someone could spend hours and find out what's the problem, how to guide a person, rather than shift them here, shift them there, and shift them there, and that person's value is not recognized. So it is a good a statistical thing, like the, when you take your car, they have numbers that they could check whether they did it or they did not. At the end, there is a value for right. that. But the ultimate result is how the patient did and how did this person benefited from the time you spend with it. Great. What's your name, sir? Sir, what's your name? Right? Yeah. What's your name? Javad, my name. Javad, I can hang out with you. We, we should talk. We should talk after this lecture. So let me ask you, David, I'm going to come back to you. So RVU, so I said relative value, and so if you can understand, by nature, it's designed to do comparisons. You have a problem with that, or are you comfortable with that? I'm going to come back, David. You had a problem, or are you comfortable with that? Tell me. So if my value goes up, your value goes down. You're fine with that or you have a problem with that? It's a zero-sum game in RVU at the end of the day. You like it or hate it for improving value? It works or it doesn't work? If you produce more value and it's a zero-sum, then I got to ultimately produce less value in, under our RVU system. You like that or hate that for improving the value of the healthcare system? What do you think? You don't like it? You don't think it works? Okay, what are you thinking? Well, so two things. One is there's my personal feeling about it. It turns out if your value is higher than mine, I'm not going to feel great about that. So that's one part of it. On the other hand, do I want to live in a world or a country where values are recognized so that sort of, you know, value overall is increased? I probably do. So sort of like free trade. Right. I, I may not like my industry going down, but I love buying cheap things at Walmart. <laughs> You know, so I went on that way. But the, the one comment I wanted to make was, you know, the, the word value here is kind of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. Because it's really not what was being described before, this idea of what does it mean to patients. It's what does it cost people. It's right. really a, a relative cost unit. Right. And, and, and cost doesn't equal value. You know, so it, it's, it's again the way like health maintenance organizations, they're terms that sound right. really good, but they're created because they sound really good rather than they actually do what they say. Great. And uh, were you guys using a specific definition of value here? Were you guys doing like quality divided by cost or some other? Well, you know, I, I, I don't think we, there were some discussions of that early on, but I okay. think the idea was in the end, I think what most people would argue is things that make people healthier while consuming fewer resources increase value. Okay. Right? I mean, broadly speaking. All right, so we'll come to that at the end. Yes, sir, at the back. KRVU is uh, purely, uh, it's purely a statistical aberration. It has nothing to do with value, but it has to do with how are you going to distribute the time amongst all of them. Nothing else. It doesn't mean that what you do is better than the value. Rather than when we get together in the room, we say, you're going to get this much, you're going to get this much, and that's not the distribution. Great. So, again, I'm being. Um, dramatic for effect purposes. So, so far that what I'm hearing is, if you want to improve the value of healthcare, the way that we're doing e and codes right now, and anybody that's working on it is not going to get us there. The way that we're doing quality measures right now is not going to get us there. Again, I'm putting an asterisk there because there's some caveats there. Now I'm hearing RVUs, definitely not going to get us there. What about value-based payments? These, what is that about? Uh, in, in public sector, based on my understanding, it's improving technical and allocated efficiency. But I think, and I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, in the uh, private sector, maybe it's about improving the uh, clinical efficiency to get the most, uh, the patient uh, supposed to have, or to get uh, the most benefit from the dollar he or she paid. Right, so let me um, backdrop to answer your question. So you can decide how you want to do this. You can do it on effectiveness or on efficiency. So that last example, I think you were talking about efficiency. So 
for uh, the same results with fewer inputs, kind of an efficiency or at the same time from a resource standpoint. Or you don't have to necessarily do that. So you can literally just say, it, I, I want certain outcomes, and if you, you achieve certain outcomes, I'll pay more for them. So you don't necessarily have to have an efficiency component. You can literally be an effectiveness component that says for certain outcomes, I'm willing to pay more. Which also means for if you don't achieve those outcomes, I'm willing to pay less. So let me just ask you, let's, with that simple analogy, right, with that simple approach, we pay more if you have outcomes, we pay less if you don't achieve those outcomes. What about that as a way to improve the value proposition in healthcare? You like that one? It's a tough crowd. You don't like anything I'm bringing forward. You like that one? Like this, you're demolishing my whole career right in front of me, so I'm trying to figure out if I've wasted the last two decades. Yes, ma'am. Do you mean, for example, like private health insurance and preventive healthcare in order to save more in the future? No, it can be that, but let's keep it even simpler. Let's keep it even simpler. Let's say you're taking care of a panel of diabetics. You have a diabetics in your panel. Your diabetics hit their targets for hemoglobin A1C, and so because of their better managed, they have less complications. So I pay more for, the, for you than someone else is that's not able to control their diabetic population and get them to their targets. First group gets more money because they've achieved the outcome, the goals that we've all agreed are important for those diabetic populations. Second group gets less money because they haven't been able to do it. We like that? We don't like that one either? Do we like that one? Yes, you do all that. You can do all that if you want to. Yes, you can do the risk adjustment, that, all that you would need to be able to do that to make it um, comparable. What'd you say? Right. Those are all valid points, but before I answer those, and I can answer those, but before I answer those, you got to tell me if I can answer those, do you like it? So let me ask you this. You guys are being tough, so let me ask you this. Um, if I give you a car, a luxury car, for two years, you don't have to pay anything on it, nothing whatsoever on it. Yours for two years. You like that car? All right, we're getting somewhere. OK, so you like that. So at least I can get to an extreme, right? So let's get to an extreme. You like that in principle. Then you can ask me a bunch of details about what this really takes. Did I really steal the car? Do I own the car? You can ask a lot of stuff, right? Is it really yours? We can get into those details. But in theory, if I can give you that, you like that. So what I'm asking you guys in theory, then we get into the practicalities of it, right? Because we're working on this now. In theory. More payments to clinicians that achieve outcomes for their patient population, less payment to clinicians that don't achieve the outcomes that we think is appropriate for the population. We like that one? OK. So I think the group said that they're fine with that one. And because there's apples and oranges, we get into the details. Yes, over here. Someone have a comment or question? See how done. So, say an expert surgeon could do that in one hour, up yes. and down something. You are better. You go to work. That another one who is not expert 
could do that in two hours, half complication requires the second one. Right. Statistically, the payment is more for the one who is less expert than the one that the outcome was better. Right. So statistically, I could understand it is better for insurance companies to have something to work with. I know that. But if you are asking about value, mm -hmm. if you don't know what value is, how could we base it even on that? But in that example, if I set up the payment where the first surgeon does better than the second surgeon because we're not going to pay for the complications or any of that, you can have bundled payment. Would you be supportive of a, a model where the first pay, pay, surgeon gets um, higher payments and reimbursement than the second surgeon? Well, I, I don't know. I, I really think these are a statistical change. 20 years ago, uh, RVU came, I think, yeah. 25 years ago because of the a lot of charges was done right. to Medicare and, uh -huh. and they were um, not in an honest way and they developed it. So these are for industries and for machines that they could have all of the machines right. work the same way. And so you could put value on a, on a washing machine that works or doesn't. But in the healthcare, it's ambiguous. I know it is difficult, right. but it is ambiguous. And uh, so uh, that's why the discussion come on. Perfect. So let me do this. So I think I heard, again, in concept, this is the first one that I heard a lot of people would be comfortable with. The devil's in the details. Is that what I heard? Like, if we can't operationalize it, then you messed it up. But at least conceptually, um, and there's some that disagree, but at least conceptually, you might be comfortable with a differential, differentiated payment for those that outperform or perform at a higher level than those that don't perform at that level. Is that what I heard? And so by agreeing with that, then this might be one way that you can improve the value proposition of healthcare. Yes or no? Yes or no? You agree that this is one way that you can prove the value of healthcare? Yes or no? Yes. All right, so we're split. Some agree, some don't. So let me take you to another one, this last one here. Networks, and I'm using it to mean for this purpose of this limited situation, I'm using it to talk about provider networks, right? So these are networks, so you might hear the term, are they in network or are they out of network, right? It's an insurance term that's normally being used to be able to say, hey, if I have this Blue Cross Blue Shield card or I have a Cigna or an Aetna, you matter, whomever, it doesn't matter. If I have this card and I want to go to this particular provider, are they in my network? Because if they're in my network, I know certain activities will go along with that, including it costs me less to go see them than if they're out of network, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. So we're not talking about anything other than that for now, just so you get the concept down. So now what's happening is large employers are coming along and saying, again, large employers, pick any of them, doesn't matter. Large employers are coming along, and they're saying, hey, we think there's enough information to show that at minimum, you can probably get rid of the worst clinicians, facilities, whatever you want to talk about in your network. They don't perform at the same level as the people at the top tier. You know, we do decile performances. So let's say it's on a decile, so it's 10 deciles. At minimum, in our network, if I'm a big employer, right, so I got hundreds of thousands of employees. I don't want them going to anybody that's in those lower two deciles. I want them out the network for my employees. So for my employees, I want a high performance network. What about that for improving the value of healthcare? What do you think about that one? So that means if you're, if you're an employee, you pretty much know that you're gonna get a higher quality clinician than what normally would have happened because you would have potentially had the broadest network possible. Yes, sir. If you're limited to where those providers and red networks are. Yes, you are. Say that some of your employees live a little far, maybe they're more rurally located, they're not where your company is, where there's close proximity to these providers, there's no in-network providers close by. You force a disparity. 
let's say there's not a network adequacy. Let's say I solve for that. And I can't solve for that. A lot of places we can solve for that. You're right, in some situations, it's rural, it's geographically um, uh, difficult for them to be able to get over certain terrain, things of that nature. It makes it much more cost prohibitive. But if I don't have that issue, are you fine with that approach for improving value? All right. Yes, ma'am. Great, so you're supportive of this one. If, For the most part, if it works. I mean, we always have to operationalize it appropriately, as we just said over there, for network accuracy. But you definitely see, sound like this one here does have the opportunity to improve the value proposition for healthcare. If you're measuring high performance appropriately. Right, it has, you have to operationalize. Others in agreement? Okay, so we got, it sounds like with this one, we're in agreement. What about you on this one? You don't like this one either? You don't like this one either? Uh. I don't, I mean, it, it's maybe because it's almost the opposite of, okay, supposedly if you can actually measure the high value clinicians, then you shouldn't have to do this networking thing because you should be going with the high value clinicians. As soon as you network, then you're gonna have people in in your high value, your high performance network who actually aren't high performance buyers, but they're just lumped in now because they're No, they won't be lumped in, they're tiered out. They're taken out. They're taken out. That like how the network's working. Yeah, that's how it works. Really, that's how it works. I know you don't have to trust a bow tie, but that's how it works. <laughs> that's literally how it works. You tier it, you decide how aggressive you want to be on the tier, and you decide how much steers you want to be able to do to for that particular tier, and then you put a pricing around it. No, so because remember, no. Say that last portion again. Say it, I said, say it. Say it. Networks, as I understand them, is that, mm -hmm. okay, we, we cover the, you know, we partner with the University of Chicago Medical Center, we partner with Feinberger, whatever, to hear. Okay. Yeah. So you have a provider who is hired by the University of Chicago, but maybe they're not as high performing, but they get lumped in as being included in, in network because they are. In the of Got it. You're, you're get, so let me, uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. That is so perfect. Because that's part of the tension that unfolds. So I'm glad you clarified what issue you were talking about. So let me um, peel that back a little bit. Because this is where values actually bump up against each other all the time in healthcare, right? This happened, and this is just a great example of it. So let's take the example you just gave. And again, you saw that big disclaimer, so this has nothing to do unique to Blue Cross and Blue Shield, United, Aetna, Signal. We all do it, it doesn't matter. But let's say a university, we just have it at University of Chicago, it could be any other provider that's big and powerful, has a strong brand recognition, right? So not one that doesn't, but someone like University of Chicago has strong brand recognition, like you said. You're not gonna wanna be tiered out of the network, because it's gonna suggest to large employers and others that you aren't performing at the level that your brand suggests you're performing at, to your point. So you're gonna to wanna to be in there. It's gonna be behooving to the insurance company, if possible, you're right, if possible, you're gonna want the high value, the high uh, recognized brand provider to be in there as well, because it looks odd that you t t t took them out of the network if the common understanding in that geography is that they're a high performer, right? Regardless of the measures right now, then you add the measure into it. So you're correct, if that conflict does happen, then you take it one step lower that says, let's assume 
you are going to tear them, and you're going to tear them down to the individual clinician level. There's a lot of issues about getting down to the individual clinician level, uh, depending upon what specialty we're talking about, whether or not there's enough sample size to really be able to do that. But let's stipulate that away for the purpose of the discussion. So you're correct. So now let's say, to keep it simple, we say, OK, we got this great um, uh, panel of uh, clinicians, physicians in this situation, um, but some of them don't perform as well as the others in the group. Your question is, well, but when they come in, the people that don't perform as well in that physician group practice, do they still get access to those patients? Because I just hired a high-performing network with the expectation that they get to see high-performing clinicians. And now you got some of these ones that are in that physician group practice that aren't performing. Right? You're correct. That does happen. So then there's questions about how you actually address that. And there's a lot of different ways that individuals, whether it be the, whether you put the onus upon the health system to correct that, or whether you put the onus within the contracting vehicle, which there are ways to be able to do that, to steer away from that as well. But thanks for raising that. That is a conflict, and then you work through that particular issue. And there are ways to be able to actually work through that issue. Um, side note, we did that even with specialty physician pharmacy uh, uh, preference items. You have physicians, this gets into a, like group purchasing organization and value proposition, where you have clinicians, um, whether it be cardiologists, uh, like interventional cardiologists, or whether it be surgeons, they have items that they prefer. This is how I do my procedure. I prefer this item. And they got trained by Johnson & Johnson or Cordis or whomever to go ahead and teach them how to do that particular procedure. So they love that item. Regardless that that item might cost three times as much as a similar alternative option. And so on the supply chain in hospitals, this happens all the time, the supply chain manager is trying to get everybody to get on the same because they get volume discounts and they pretty much function the same. But if those clinicians were trained differently, and oftentimes, once you're outside a fellowship, you're trained by your colleagues or by the, by the manufacturer, then you're going to go with what the manufacturer say because you're not footing the bill for it and you want the hospital to foot the bill for it. So then the hospital has to foot the bill for it because you're the permanent cardiologist or the surgeon. And so you're willing to go ahead and have it three times and it has nothing to do with improving the value of the healthcare system. And we call those physician preference items. And then we spend a lot of time trying to get that out. And there's ways to do that. Part of that is transparency and show how difference in the variability is, and that doesn't make any difference. And some of that is what we do here in value-based payment, where we put contracts on top of it that forces the physician group practice to go back and have those difficult conversations with a colleague that says, you really are going to cost us without showing any improvement whatsoever in patient outcomes. Are you sure you want this item that's three times more expensive because it has nothing to do because I'm getting the same outcomes or better outcomes that you're getting with a different device? Which says to them, if you're willing to admit to me that I'm a better clinician than you, you can get this item. But you're telling me I'm a three times better clinician than you. I don't believe you really want to say that. So let's have this conversation. So there's ways that we get underneath that. All right. In the interest of time, because I want to open this up for any questions that we didn't, let me run through this last one right here. Again, this is just a term that I use. I call it reflection. It doesn't matter um, for selfies. Uh, so now we have selfies that did just pure documentation. We have selfies for examination so that you can understand the interaction. And now I'm just calling this one reflection. And so in this particular situation, what I'm calling this is like, this encompasses integration. This says I'm not going to pick it apart by individual uh, items. So when I was doing the examination, I want to see different aspects of it, understand their relationship. I just want to integrate it as much as possible. So now I'm trying to look at it from a holistic standpoint. So when I'm looking at that photo, I'm trying to take into consideration everything that's unfolding. So let's look at this selfie. Does anybody know who this is, this person here? Who? It can only be one person. Who is it? Beyonce. Of course it's Beyonce. <laughs> You cannot have a lecture on value and not have Beyonce in it. Of course it's Beyonce. It's Queen Bay. So this Queen Bay over here, who is this? Who's that? Who's this? Her daughter? Who is it? Daughter. Yeah, so this is her daughter, Blue Ivy. So this is her daughter, right? So this is a selfie. They had a uh, basketball game. They took a selfie. So this is a relationship. So you, and this selfie is not about documentation. She doesn't need to necessarily document that that's her daughter, all that type of stuff. You can see they put the Snapchat filters on and had a little fun with it. So that's what this one is. 
far different than when we started, right? Where Buzz Aldridge just wanted to document that he's in outer space. Far different than me just wanting to document that I was with President uh, Bush. This is much more about the family interaction that's occurring at that particular time because we all know how busy Beyonce is. She's everywhere all that type of time. She needs to be able to take time out and enjoy family activity. Who is this? Stand up, Amy, so they can see who, who both of us is. <laughs> right. So she got Dalmatian ears. I don't know what type of ears it is. We got these long tons. This was yesterday in the office. <laughs> right. Similar thing where we just want to be able to show we interact. We're on the same team. You know, not as cute as Beyonce, obviously, but we can go ahead and do silly things too. And so that's us. So that's just a quick example of a reflection where you're having fun, but you're taking it to the totality, and you're seeing how people interact, and so it's much more about the relationship than necessarily document that you've been together at one point to the time. Let's talk about this real quick, and then we'll open it up for the last five, uh, five minutes. So when you're talking about reflection, I said, remember, we're talking about the understanding that encompasses the entire integration. Consumer experience. What do we think about a value proposition related to consumer experience? And it can be patient, it can be member, we call them members. For clinicians, it would be patients. Other people call them consumers, so I just use the broadest term. Uh, so don't beat me up about that. Consumer experience, community relationships, what about that stuff for improving the value of healthcare? You care about any of that? Yes. Tell me more. What do you care about? They're, they're logical things. Okay, sounds reasonable to me. Others care about that? Yes or no? You hate it? Since it sounds like E&M, you like it better or worse than E&Ms? You like it better or worse than E&Ms? Better. Better? Who, who thinks it's worse than E&Ms? I, I prefer worse. Well, tell us why it's worse, Dave. <laughs> you want to be consistent? experience. So say you're a really wealthy person, you're not sick at all, and you want a doctor who will, you know, just answer every call you want at every moment. That is a great consumer experience. Should should we you know use tax dollars to pay for it or subsidize it with tax breaks? I'm not sure. So that's one. Um, community relationships. So you know I'm really deep for a community um, relationships that is really important, but I also know that the not-for-profit sector is sometimes kind of corrupt and kind of inefficient, uh -huh. and sometimes those community relationships turn into money that goes down to holes or buys stuff that does not produce social value. Right. So, um, and I mean, like, take social determinants of health, super right. interesting area. I've had community health workers who I've worked for who I would fight to my death to keep right. on my team. I've had some who've used it as a paid vacation. Yeah. So all of that. So let me, I'm going to run through these last two slides, given, and I'm going to come back to David's um, uh, warning, caution, that just because it sounds good, it might not be good, and there might be a lot of issues. It might have a lot of unintended consequences along that. And we actually might be even more inefficient, which means more wasteful than we already are wasteful. So I'm going to come back to that. So let me tell you what we did in the last couple of years, and Amy's helping lead this. Uh, as well, uh, and I say last couple of years, but it's really gotten going in the last year, to be honest. And uh, this relates to that social determinants of health. So 80% of healthcare spend is affected by social environment. In fact, you guys have probably seen this, right? Have you guys seen that in some form or fashion? Some might say 60%, but most people say 80%, which means whether you take the lower number of 60% or whether you take the high number of 80%, what it basically says is, for the most part, when we've been talking about value, we spend a lot of time talking about healthcare services. And we spend the majority of time on that, even though that's only 20% of anything that's going to have to, anything to do with the, improving the health outcomes of patients. So the four walls within the physician office or the four walls within the uh, hospital setting, best case scenario is going to impact 20% of that, those individual population health outcomes. That's it. The other 80% is outside in the community uh, in some form or fashion. And you'll see uh, when they don't use the 80%, that's because they reserve 20% for genetics. And then they do the 60%, right? So anywhere from 60 to 80% has nothing to do whatsoever with the current way that we actually practice healthcare. 
right? So then we came along and said, well, given that reality, and we started this, this is why we have this institute. So I'm the chief medical officer for the National Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. We launched an um, institute, which is a wholly owned subsidiary that's focused on all these social determinants of health that says, okay, we're going to get outside the four walls of the clinical setting, get into where people actually live, what are the barriers that's impacting their health outcomes based upon where they live, what communities they're in, and then how can we make a difference? So ride to you, rolling the health. Okay, real quick, because we're short on time, what we ended up doing was looking at all these areas where there's transportation deserts, and we also looked at not only where there's transportation deserts, we looked at whether or not there's PCP capacity relative to the needs within those particular communities, and when we actually did all the analysis, we also saw that there was PCP deserts where there's just not enough PCPs for the needs for those particular communities. And so we're going to have to provide transportation because they're going to need to get to a place where there's enough PCPs uh, to meet their particular need. So we've been doing transportation now. And now you probably are well aware of Medicare Advantage recently with the, uh, their final letter in the uh, first week of April allows supplemental medical benefits. So transportation now is coming into healthcare full steam. And in a couple of years, you'll see that's going to be pretty common, that individuals will be screening for social determinants of health. All of you guys that are doing clin clinical work will probably start screening for these social determinants of health, and then being able to make referrals for transportation or what other else needs are needs. OK, so that's one way that we're trying to think about ways to improve the value proposition. Keeping in mind, these are relatively inexpensive services in comparison to showing up in the ER or being bounced back into the hospital. So we think the savings are there to justify the service from the ROI standpoint. And then I'm going to open it up for questions after this. Food queue. This has gotten a lot of publicity in Chicago um, because we launched this in March. And we've been in everything. As soon as we launched it, we were in the Chicago Tribune. We were in the Chicago Sun-Times. We were on WTTW, uh, Chicago Tonight. We were in Food and Wine, we were in Forest, we went everywhere. Because it said for the first time, we have big health insurance companies coming into nutritional services saying we think it's fundamentally critically important for people to maintain a healthy lifestyle. We have to make it convenient, have to make it affordable. And obviously, people don't want to eat food that tastes nasty, so it has to be flavorful, right? It has to taste good. And it does taste really good, which is why you have this up here. So you'll hear this, this is still on radio ads. There's, um, Bus signage around here as well. All this particular activity that's underway. Chicago was the first market. We're moving to Dallas next. And we're just going to keep building. Similarly, Medicare, my former employers have come along now and said, hey, similar to transportation, we recognize that nutrition is one of the reasons why people bounce back into the ER and bounce back into the hospital, the diabetic, heart failure, you name it. And so now what they're doing on the Medicare Advantage side is to go ahead and allow for you to add supplemental medical nutritional benefits to be able to say, hey, if you think nutrition can help those chronic conditions, be a chronic, people with chronic conditions be able to maintain a healthy lifestyle, we believe that's going to improve the overall value for um, our patient panels for Medicare members. And so you can be able to do that as well. Right? So that's a fundamental different approach than everything that I start off with. So the first half of my career, I was doing a lot of things that I talked about in the first half of this, about quality measures, improving the quality measures, value-based payments, leading to value, uh, uh, value networks. This second stage of my career, now I'm doing a lot more along these particular lines where we're trying to think that we're taking a more holistic approach so that as soon as you write a prescription, you're not realizing that they can't get to the pharmacy, so they need a ride to get to be to the pharmacy. And so we look at pharmacy desert, nutrition deserts, PCP deserts. And um, soon, thanks to Amy's leadership, uh, we're going to be doing fitness as well. And so we're spending a lot of time looking at fitness deserts and ways that we're approaching that as well. What about that for improving health care? You hate that or you like that one? You hate that? You like that one? Oh. I feel like I got Howard Cosell. Now I can retire as Muhammad Ali. All right, so we got one example that you guys like at least. We're okay. Questions, because that's the end. We got like five minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am. So we will be expanding to Medicaid. So Medicaid had more restrictions early on. So what we said is let us operationalize it in the commercial market, move it to MA, and now we're going to start working with Medicaid to be able to figure out, because you know it's on a, such a state-by-state -state basis, to figure out what's required on a state-by-state -state basis to do it for Medicaid as well.
Absolutely. Yes, sir. So I'm sure that in your previous work and what you do now, you've heard some of the same kind of criticisms of the other systems that are in place that we just discussed from other people. In your position now, do you feel like you have inherited this system and there's not much you can do to change the way things are? Do you think you have some power to change that where you are? Or is it more like we're just, we have to deal with what we're dealt and we're going to find things like these I think um, we definitely can, we definitely look for ways to improve upon that first high. So all the issues that you talked about, so for example, just prior authorization is going to be a big one. I think we'll, you'll see that we're going to make some movements around prior authorization to, to ease the burden and the, the houses related to all that. On the quality measurement, that one is always tough because um, it depends on how we do it and it gets into a lot of debates. And, and so on that one, I'm a little more nervous that I was, 10 years ago, I was gung-ho optimistic that we'd solve everything related to the quality measure. Now I'm a little bit more reserved in my aggressiveness on the quality measure. The high-performing networks or a value-based payment, that's here to stay, at least in some form or fashion, value-based payments. I say here to stay at least for the next decade. I'm 50, at least for the next decade. I'll revisit whether I care at 60, but right now, for the next decade, that's probably here to stay. Um, what do you want to call them, narrow network or tiered networks, high-performing networks, employers definitely want that. That's going to happen. So, and it's going to grow because that's what employers want. And employers are the ones that's footing the bill for that. Even though we're having more and more uh, individuals doing high deductible health plans and things of that nature, it's still primarily employer-based uh, models for private health insurance. So that's going to continue to grow as well. And then what we're doing here, to your point on your second half, is we're trying to push in so innovative ways in which healthcare can continue to move forward where there shouldn't be a lot of debate among providers and payers about how we want to be able to do this effectively. And so because that doesn't have those type of concerns and we're not grading physicians on this one way or the other, then let's find that common ground and keep moving forward and improving it. And so I think you're going to hear more and more discussions around community health and being able to talk about opportunities to make a difference because part of what we end up doing when we're doing this and we have all the spatial analysis and we do the visualization so we can drill down we drill down to the block group level anywhere we want to go in the country and then we aggregate at zip code level so we get pretty granular so you'll see when we're doing this stuff you're like the regressions are crazy Dave. It's like 700 million regressions just to be able to get accurate on this stuff literally it's crazy stuff um, but it's, it's pretty cool too um, it really is, for, for geeky people, it's pretty cool. Um, but you'll see more of that type of activity um, unfolding where you'll see us continue to push more towards this now and on community health. Where I was going is, when I talk in other settings, I talk about um, that if you don't do this, it's gonna be very difficult for employers to put a facility or a distribution center or whatever into your hometown or into your community because they're looking at how sick that population is. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all that. And say, well, why would I go ahead and put a new distribution center in that neighborhood? Because you're telling me this is the, these are the employees I'm going to have. And I can tell you by looking at those employees, they're going to be really expensive. So civic leaders need to actually address these issues too. And so that's the reason why we also think there's going to be groundswell where you have it from both the healthcare side that's looking at and then from the economic side uh, in those local cities saying, okay, we got to have healthy individuals in our community so that they can actually be hired. Yes, sir. I guess what I thank, thank you. So you uh, thank you. The organization or entity trying to, to provide or take over for healthcare needs, for food needs, transportation, I feel there's a lot of linkage to disaster management. And that may not be a bad yeah. analogy of where we are healthier anyway right now. But one of the things that seems to hold true with that is that we do great for a little while, and then the effect peers out, and we either forget about it or we hit the next disaster. So yeah. what strategies are you all taking? To yeah, that's that? excellent. So l let me tell you, that's one of the reasons why we actually create the institute, because of that issue. Um, and we were concerned because the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality have put a lot of money in a lot of these different community experts. And what we found was even the ones that were effective, that they had proven to be successful, they wrote it up, they did a great job, RCTs even on some of this community-based stuff, uh, but they weren't sustained. And so our hypothesis, we'll see if we're proven wrong or right, is our hypothesis was that all those weren't sustained because there wasn't a business model that actually allowed for sustainability. And so you notice everything that we end up doing like 
when we first did transportation, we did it with Lyft and then we expanded it, right? But we knew Lyft was going to be in the business. We know other people that was going to be in the business aligns with where their strategic priorities are. And so what we end up doing on the institute side is we'll put something in, in the market with a business partner or several business partners with the expectation that it aligns with their strategic objectives and they see it as a growth opportunity. And so once we've proven the model, then we scale it and sustain it through the business. And so that's fundamentally different than the traditional approaches that's been either grant dollars or philanthropic approaches or something along those nations. Yes, ma'am. Just a little bit more understanding of the business model here. Um, so is this nonprofit, for profit, based on what you're saying, Yeah. Yeah, so let me clarify because um, the delineation about nonprofit for profit matters on some aspects and doesn't matter on others. So let me walk you through it real quick. So, my parent company so that I'm CMO for, right, Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, is a non for profit, right? So, my parent is a non for profit. We still pay taxes, though. Blue Cross, even though they say non profit, Blue Cross has to pay all these taxes. So, it doesn't matter from a tax standpoint. We pay taxes on all this stuff. Underneath that, we set this up as a benefit corporation. So I asked for specific permission to set it up as a benefit corporation. So a benefit corporation is a hybrid because it's required to have a social mission just like a nonprofit does, but I can gain access to capital like a for-profit would. And the idea goes to what you guys just asked at the back, which is at some point if I want to go out and raise, get a, do a capital raise, I can do a capital raise to deal with any uh, short-term losses or anything of that nature so that it can sustain itself. Because what we'll ultimately do, which is what you asked about the business model, what we're ultimately basically doing is taking what were like niche plays. So if you think about right now, some of you probably like purchase healthy food options and have them delivered to your home. The price point is too high for the average individual in these particular communities, especially once you throw in delivery. So we reached agreement with our financial modeling that we're just going to make it a volume play. I'm going to push the price point down. I need to have enough volume to push that price point down. And so I need to be able to just sustain myself to be able to actually have access to capital to sustain it. It's all right now funded through Blue Cross and Blue Shield, either through our parent company or through direct plans like HCSC, Blue Cross Blue Shield Illinois. It's worked with us to be able to sustain it. And then we can go do capital raise if we need to go do capital raise outside of that. Great. I know we're up against time. Uh, anything else, Martin, before we shut down? Thanks for having me. We look forward to Oh, did you want to do a selfie before we leave? Quick question. Can we have you guys come down? We just want to do one quick selfie before we leave, if that's OK. Just right in here. Sorry. Thank you. Just right in here. If you can come right down here. Please, just come right down here in the middle. We're going to do a selfie together. <laughs>